Welcome everybody to our ending neck pain webinar. Boy, this is a big topic and you know, you're all here because you have concerns about it, but I just want you to know how big this is that there are um, pretty much eight out of 10 people either have acute neck pain right now, or they have chronic ongoing neck pain that, that comes and disturbs them often. And so tonight I want to go through the things that can cause neck pain and really understand the message that our body is giving us when we have neck pain so that we can, once we understand what's causing it, then we can find what the solutions are. Uh, and so remember that implementation is everything here. So I want you to take good notes. And at the end of this, I want you to have some action steps that you're ready to take into account and put into place and make room in your calendar so that you can just start to do the things you need to do so you too can have ease in the function of your neck. Now your neck is really important. It's not just a pain in the neck as they say, but the neck is the top of your spine. And so if you wanna be healthy, you need to have a healthy nervous system. If you want a healthy nervous system, you need a healthy spine. And the neck is the top of the spine, so it's really important. So let's jump right in and carry on here. Is it going to advance for me? Let's see. There we go. Uh, so next month is gonna be our ending headaches month. And so many of you that have neck pain, it kind of travels up into your head. Sometimes it's traveling down the arms, but for some people it travels up into the head and then they're getting headaches too. So join us next month, the last Wednesday of the month. And we're gonna be talking about headaches. And if you know anybody that is struggling with headaches, then please share this with them as well. All right, so there's something that has happened in our culture where neck pain has just become um, so much more common than ever before. And why do you think that is? Well, it's because, oh, and by the way, um, if you want to make sure that you're getting signed up and getting the notifications for that web webinar, then just send us a text at our number 802-985-9850. So, it's because of something called tech neck, right? Okay, so everybody raise your hand if you own a cell phone. Yeah, okay. And raise your hand if you, if everyone in your family has one too. Yeah, okay. All right. And then if you do have kids, I don't know if any of you do, but oftentimes if you're watching the recording, right? I want you to raise your hand, even if you're watching the recording, if your kids have cell phones because this is where the biggest trouble starts is, and especially it's happening younger and younger. And so this is literally a medical diagnosis now called tech neck um, that you can put in a code for. Um, it's because, you know, there is so, so much happening when we are using these phones and we're losing track of our body as we're using them and we're looking down and it's causing a lot of neck problems. You won't believe the kind of neck problems that I'm going to show you tonight that it causes. But if you think that using cell phones is kind of bad, if you kind of just get a sense that we're all using them too much, you will really see why that is and why we're in trouble if we are. And this next generation is really in trouble. So tech neck, it can lead to chronic neck and nerve problems. It can lead to um, herniated bulging discs. I mean, the, the list goes on of all the ways that it can actually be affecting our bodies. And so I want to also cover something else that has added to tech neck, especially in the last three years. And this may uh, come as a surprise to you, or maybe it won't, but there's now something in addition that we call, uh, let's see if I can get this to carry on. There it is, mask neck. So mask neck is something where, remember, if you have a mask on, and so I know we haven't had them for a little while, but from what I hear, they're about to come back, you know, so I want you to be prepared here that when you're wearing a mask, it actually covers your peripheral vision of, for looking down. And so you'll tend to bend your head further forward than you usually would without a mask. And it's similar to what I see in people that have bifocals you know, where they have to kind of look down or look up, depending on which part of the glass they're using. And that actually can cause neck problems as well. Well, now we have this thing called mask neck. So it's just it's just ramping up the tech neck problem all, that we already had. So just please be aware of that. And, and by the way, I just heard about a study about wearing masks, just a little sidestep here, 
um, that it actually does affect your CO2 in a big way if you do need to wear them. So I would minimize it as much as possible um, wearing those masks for both the sake of your neck and for the pH and the chemistry in your body because it can really cause health problems we're now finding out. Okay, so neck problems, how do they show up? Well, of course, neck pain, stiffness, tightness, loss of range of motion, but that can all lead to degenerative change and arthritic changes. People that get the popping and the cracking, but those nerves that come out of the neck, they go right down into the upper extremity. So you can have upper extremity issues as well. And then it can travel up into your head. So you can have headaches as well. I would tell you that uh, eight out of nine of the upper extremity problems that people present with, I find the cause of it is actually in the neck. So we're gonna unpack that as well tonight. Uh, so these are the kinds of ways that it shows up here in my office. But with this poor posture that was one of the contributing factors to neck pain, it comes along with its own problems. So check this out. Poor posture is associated with reductions in testosterone levels, reduced serotonin, which is the feel-good hormone, uh, increases in cortisol, which is the stress hormone, and reduced feelings of power also come along with poor posture, which is linked to neck pain. So we want to definitely be addressing neck pain by looking closely at posture. We want to learn some good spinal hygiene for addressing poor posture, because that's what can then affect the neck. Um, there's a great comic strip that I saw one time, a Peanuts comic strip. You all remember Peanuts with Charlie Brown. And so Charlie Brown, of course, is in this, you know, depressed state and his head is down and he's talking to Peppermint Patty and he's, I think they're walking by the Lucy's psychology booth <laughs> and, uh, and, and Charlie Brown is saying to Peppermint Patty, you know, when you're depressed, it's really important that you hold your head down because if you hold your head up, you just don't get the same joy out of being depressed. <laughs> So definitely posture is linked to our, our view of the world. And um, there's actually research that shows that. And this is where some of that research came through as well. And so if you are struggling with poor posture and you want to have a consultation or any of those things that we mentioned, especially if you're watching this recording, just send us a text to 802-985-9850 and we'll set up a consultation one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, there it is. That's the picture. I forgot that I had popped this in here. Yeah. So this is my depressed stance. And when you're just depressed, it makes a lot of difference how you stand. The worst thing you can do is straighten up and hold your head high because then you start to feel better. If you're going to get any joy out of being depressed, you've got to stand like this, right? All right. So I want to share a success story with you of somebody that I worked with that came in because they did have neck pain. Uh, and so they were also having brain fog and chronic fatigue. And their neck pain went right down into their upper back uh, and they felt like they were twice their age, right? I've heard that before. And so they had been going downhill. They were losing hope. They had seen a lot of doctors, different chiropractors. Um, but once they started to see us, of course, what we did is we were very thorough. We looked at everything about their spine and nervous system. We looked at what in their lifestyle was contributing to it. And you know, it's all about that three-legged stool. It's just, it's about getting adjusted in a rhythm. It's about doing spinal exercises and about breaking bad habits. So we worked with all of those things with her and, uh, and she certainly saw the fog lift. She was able to get through her day without a nap. So her energy levels came up, um, the pain had lessened and she just kept feeling better and better. So a uh, great success story right there. And uh, this is one of many that we have on people that struggle with neck pain. So when you do have neck pain, it is a signal that your body is giving you. And so every month we cover a different condition specific solution for other types of body signals that the body gives, because we want you to learn how to listen to your body. And once you're listening, then you'll be able to address it. Now, most of the time when we have neck pain in our culture, we just try to dampen that signal down so we don't have to listen to it. So we'll use medications to try and stop the pain or we'll just live around it. But um, I know that there are lots of people that are struggling with neck pain because 
When I'm driving, I see you. You're the ones that are trying to live around it by uh, hoping the rear view mirror is catching everything because you can't turn your head to look to see if it's safe to change lanes, right? So you're using the hope and pray lane change technique or strategy, right? Instead of actually being able to turn your neck and safely make sure that it is safe to change lanes. So you want to listen to the signals, not just try living around them, because when you live around them, you're going to get into trouble. And so if we can understand what the signal is telling us, then we can take the appropriate steps. So anytime you have a symptom, it's going to land in a certain range here. So the symptoms are there to tell you what direction you're headed. So everybody is on this illness wellness continuum somewhere. At one end, there's early death where you're losing function so fast that you're heading uh, down to a premature death. The other end is high level wellness, robust wellness. And then there's a middle zone here. And the middle zone is the not sick zone. So we have the sick side, the healthy side, and then we have the not sick side, middle range, which is also the not healthy range. Now, the tricky thing about this is there's no symptoms necessarily going on here. It's not until you pass that middle point and you start to move towards greater and greater loss of function that you'll get the symptoms starting to show up. And there are often signs that you're moving in the wrong direction. A sign is something you can measure, but not necessarily something that you can feel. So for example, blood pressure or blood sugar. Many people don't feel like they have anything wrong, but then they go and get their laboratory tests and the signs in the lab tests tell them that they're moving in the wrong direction. So by the same token, there are ways that we can detect signs that you're moving towards symptoms, including symptoms of neck pain and headache and brain fog and fatigue and all those kinds of things. And then if the symptoms persist and you just try to live around them and you're not really doing anything to improve your function, you may move into the realm of disability where now the symptoms are no longer correctable. That's disability and that's heading you towards early death. So when the symptoms show up, it's that warning sign to tell you you're moving away from health right now and you need to make some change. That's the purpose of the symptom is to tell you you need to make some change. And I don't mean you have a deficiency of painkillers, that that's the change that needs to happen, right? Neck pain is not caused by, by a deficiency of medication. It's caused, it's your body telling you that something needs to change. And that means something in your lifestyle needs to change. So that's exactly what I want to be covering tonight is what are the things that if you have neck pain that you have to make changes in so that you can actually just end that neck pain forever. All right. And so now recognize that when you feel something, there's only a certain part of the nervous system that's responsible for feeling things. That's the sensory nerves. They feel things like hot and cold. They feel pressure. They, the posture is part of the sensory nerves as well. <clears throat> so knowing where your body is in space is the, the, the thing we call proprioception. So, you know, I can put my hand behind me and, and if I'm not looking, I still know exactly where my body is in space. I know where my hand is. I know how many fingers I'm holding up. I know that, right? Because of how I can feel it. I don't have to see it to know that. That feeling sense is proprioception. And that is one of the jobs of the sensory nerves as well. And pain is. Now the sensory nerves that feel pain only make up 10% of the entire nervous system. The other nerves are controlling the muscles, that's the motor nerves, and the autonomic nerves control all the automatic functions in the body. So controlling the glands and the the immune system, your energy levels, your digestion, your breathing, all of those kinds of things. That's the autonomic nervous system's job. The motor nerves are controlling muscle functions. So if you start to have interference in the motor nerves, you might notice weakness or spasms or fatigue or tightness. Uh, when you have interference in the sensory nerves, sometimes you will feel pain, but sometimes you won't feel pain that you should be feeling because something's interfering with that or you won't really know exactly where your body is in space. So all the three parts of the nervous system have different jobs, but if you're only relying on the sensation of pain as your indicator of when you might have a problem in your nervous system, then you're gonna be in trouble because again, only 10% of the nervous system feels pain. So we need a better way here than just trying to live around pain when it shows up. 
And so this premise is the one that we want to have all the foundations. So we kind of want to we want to set the table before we eat here tonight. And this is how we're going to set the table. Healthy is normal is the first premise. Healthy is normal. Your body was designed to be healthy. Every cell is always trying to move towards health. Your body is smart. It was again, every cell is, has it in its original design to always move towards health. And so anytime your body does something, it's still your smart body that is doing that. Sometimes people think, well, yeah, my body is smart, except right now because my neck hurts. So something's wrong. And my body's doing something wrong here. That's oftentimes the way people think of it. And if I take this painkiller, now I'm going to override what my body's doing because my body's not smart right now, right? So as soon as things start to go sideways, we start running to the medicine cabinet, right? But actually we have to recognize, no, nope, my body is smart even now and it's trying to tell me something. And so I just need to learn how to listen to it and address it and make changes. Now, the nervous system is the master system in the body. The brain controls everything. So as long as the messages are getting from the brain out to the cells and back again without interference, you get to be healthy. And all that nervous system has to run right through the spine first and then out to the body. And the nerves then come back into the spine and then up the spine, up to the brain. And then the spine is your suit of armor that's protecting your nervous system. Your spine is your lifeline and it needs to be protected with the nervous system. Just like the skull is protecting the brain, the spinal column is protecting the spinal cord. Now we have to also recognize that modern life is unnaturally stressful, right? Who would agree with me on this, right? <laughs> yeah, the chaos, the deadlines, the demands, right? The pressures, right? All of that, not getting enough sleep, not getting being able to eat right, all of those things. Modern life is unnaturally stressful. And, you know, go, 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 but also being too sedentary. Those are all the pieces to it. And now we're going to add some cell phones and some handheld devices into that, right? And let's see what kind of stress we can create with that. And so those stresses are coming at us from three dimensions. It's not just our stressful thoughts that we have, but it's also chemical stresses, toxins, and then it's the jarring of the spine, as well as other physical stresses, which include not just the macro traumas, you know, falling down, that could jar your neck, a car accident, that could jar your neck, but it's the micro traumas that are the real problem. And so these micro traumas come in the form of bad habits and poor posture. Uh, so, you know, oftentimes we say, yeah, don't sweat the small stuff, yeah. Well, uh, there are some things that you do want to worry about. Bullets are small and little viruses are small, right? Deer ticks are small. So there are some small things we do want to pay attention to. And I promise you that this small thing of your posture when you're on your device is going to actually affect you in a very serious way. And so this is how it's going to start to show up. When our head, which weighs maybe what, 10 to 12 to 15 pounds, depending on your size, right? If your head is, is 12 pounds and it is resting right over your shoulder with healthy posture, then the body was designed to manage that in a perfect way. When we start to put the head forward, that 12 pound head is now costing you 32 or 42 pounds of work just like if you take a bowling ball and hold it close to your center of gravity, when you start to hold that bowling ball out in front of you, you're going to work harder and harder. And that's just the laws of physics. So when we are spending more and more time with our head down, it starts to affect our posture and it starts to put more stress and demand on the spine and the spinal cord inside. Now, remember, the brainstem is right at the top of the spine. Brainstem is where, where <clears throat> is what controls all of your organ systems. It's uh, where the vagus nerve comes out that affects a lot of your, lo your levels of anxiety or calmness, right? And so there can be a lot of stress on the spine when we change our posture. And so what does all this stress lead to? Something called subluxations. Subluxations are where there's joint misalignments and that causes soft tissue damage. And when you have that soft tissue damage, then that's going to then cause this inflammation and irritation to the nerves. 
that then is going to lead to your smart body wanting to reduce the irritation on the nerve. And so your smart body spasms the muscles around that joint to lock and strap that joint down. So there's no more movement, which is what is now irritating the nerves because of the joint misalignment. So your smart body spasms that. And when that happens, the disc no longer has the movement that it needs to stay healthy. So a disc does not have a lot of nerve, a lot of um, blood supply to it. The way that a disc gets nutrients in and toxins out is more like the way a sponge works. So if you squeeze a sponge, it will squeeze the water out. And when you release it, it can suck the water in. That's called imbibition. And so the disc stays healthy from movement. Well, when we strap down a joint, if it's done just temporarily for a short period of time to, to protect you, okay, that's fair enough. But when it's prolonged, that's when that disc is going to start to deteriorate. And so uh, that joint fixation can be hard on the, on the disc but also this idea of proprioception, <clears throat> knowing where the body is in space, that comes from mechanoreceptors in the joints that are sending messages up to the brain. So when you move a joint, it, that movement signals receptors that will then go up to the brain and that tells the brain where the body is in space. Movement does that. And the brain really likes to know where the body is in space because it has to navigate through the, um, the environment, through the landscape. So the more precise that the brain knows where the body is in space, then the more adaptable it is, the more it's able to change in a moment with any stress that it encounters. When the brain starts getting vague information or it's missing some pertinent, important information to know where the body is in space in some area, the body will actually go into a, a full-blown stress response when it stops getting the proper signaling. So a loss of proprioception causes <clears throat> elevated stress hormones in the body. Now, what are elevated stress hormones gonna look like? It's a stress response. So the blood pressure is gonna go up, the heart rate's gonna go up, the muscle tone is gonna go into fight or flight mode. The digestion is gonna downregulate because now is not the time to be eating lunch because the tiger's chasing you. You might be lunch, right? That's what a stress response is all about to save our life when a tiger's chasing us. Reproduction is also gonna downregulate. Not a good time to make babies if there's a stress happening right now, like a tiger, right? The serotonin levels are also gonna go down. Not a good time to sleep if a tiger is chasing you. Your sensory systems will be heightened and also will be in tunnel vision. So you actually will lose peripheral vision you'll be in tunnel vision. Fear and anxiety are elevated. Your insulin sensitivity also is going to change because you're going to want more blood sugar to get that blood sugar out to the muscles for instant energy to be able to fight the tiger. And so that's going to actually affect your insulin sensitivity and it's gonna cause more blood sugar happening in the blood. You're also gonna have a flipping of the HDLs and the LDLs and this is why the uh, lipoproteins, um, those are responsible for making hormones, including cholesterol. And so we need to have an increase in the LDLs to make more, um, actually cortisol. Let me say that, that again. The LDLs are there to make cortisol, the stress hormone. And if that's flooding your system, you need to make more of it. Now, cholesterol is also going to go up. And be, that's because cholesterol actually patches up wounds. So if you get a, you know, a gaping wound from a, a tiger going after you, it, you need cholesterol to heal that up, to heal that up. So cholesterol goes up because it needs to be prepared for if we do get wounded. And that's why the clotting factors go up as well. And then our immune response actually is going to be downregulated because it takes an enormous amount of energy to run the immune system. And our body will need to be efficient in this moment right now where it needs to put all of its resources into actually fighting off the tiger. So all of this is what we call an adaptive physiology. And adaptive physiology is meant to save our life in that moment. And it will do that. It, it will be our best chance of saving our life if there really is a tiger in front of you, if your body goes into a stress response. 
But if this stress response is coming from chronic stress, ongoing stress, <clears throat> then this whole response is going to be maladaptive. This whole response is going to start looking at a heart attack waiting to happen. This is what metabolic syndrome looks like. This is how diabetes and heart disease develops is when this is an ongoing response. And so subluxations are what can actually push you into a chronic stress mode because we have the joint misalignments happening. And then the next thing you know, there's that soft tissue damage, the inflammation that comes with it, and then the nerve irritation. So that is the key thing. Remember, you can have that nerve irritation. However, when you have that nerve irritation, again, feeling versus function, it may be interfering with the nerve supply to the muscles or the nerve supply to the organs, but you might not feel any pain because the sensory pain nerves are not being fired. So remember that you can have nerve interference without necessarily feeling pain. So let's now talk about that nerve supply. What if there's interference or subluxation in the nerves that go to the muscles or nerves that go to the organs? How might that play out? Well, in the neck area, you can see the brain will send the messages down the spinal cord and then out through the nerves. Where do these nerves go coming out of the neck? Oh, to the heart and the lungs and the stomach and the pancreas and the liver. And the you see all these organs all the way down to the large intestine are all being controlled from the vagus nerve and right at the upper cervical level here. These other nerves that come out <clears throat> the, and from the neck, they go to all the glands in the throat. So that includes your thyroid gland, your immune system. Um, it goes to the vision and hearing, all the senses the, up into the head, right? So all of those things are controlled from the nerve supply. And that's the the this is the map of the nervous system. So if you're having neck pain, what is the signal now telling you from your body is you need to change something because it's trying to tell you, you may be compromising other functions right now that are controlling your heart or your lungs or other vital organs. So that's a key thing to understand that when you have neck pain, you don't want to live around it. You don't want to mask it because it's your body saying you have to change something. Now, Again, remember that you can have the joint misalignments, the soft tissue damage, all those things, the joint fixation, but also you can have arthritic changes in the neck and you can have trouble with the upper extremity. So oftentimes we'll find people having shoulder trouble, arms, elbows, wrist, carpal tunnel. 90% of carpal tunnel that I encounter, it's actually coming from the neck and people are going in, getting all kinds of surgeries, sometimes not having a good response with that surgery. And meanwhile, the problem was always in the neck that we needed to handle anyway. Uh, hand problems, people that have trigger fingers, that kind of thing, arthritis in your hands. I literally will have people come in talking about their arthritic hands that day and we'll check their grip strength and it's weak. And then we adjust their neck and all of a sudden the grip strength is strong and their hands are feeling more easily to use. So really that upper extremity issues, it is related to the neck. And if you are struggling with that, again, send us a text and we can set up a consultation and we can talk it down and see what's going on in your situation to see whether or not we can help you. Now, these subluxations, what happens when you have a subluxation? Again, on an x-ray, if you have it over a prolonged period of time, it can start to cause this degenerative change. So the disc can bulge out, that can interfere with the flow of messages. Here's the spinal cord. These are the nerve roots that are traveling out going out to all the different parts of the body. And you can see there's pressure right there that's happening. So the x-rays actually show us not just whether there's misalignment or not, but the longer that the problem has been there, the more likely it can cause degenerative change. And so we can, when we see degenerative change on an x-ray, it tells us, okay, this problem has been there longer than you might've thought. I mean, I had someone come into the practice just this week and, um, you know, she didn't have a lot of complaints in her neck, but she was having a little trouble with her hands and arms. And when we looked at her neck, she had so much degenerative change in her neck and she never really felt very much neck pain. And yet that's what we found. So the, the x-ray is so valuable for us to get insights on it. Now, another part of the x-ray that we're starting to see is causing, is uh, showing up as an indicator when someone has poor posture for a long time, especially that tech neck piece, it's incredible what we're seeing here. So just so you understand, how does this degeneration happen? 
you can get bone spurs happening here, but the only way a bone spur happens is based on the laws of physics. So if you have a good forward curve in the spine, it means you have given the spine, that's your shock absorber. And as long as you have that, then the weight distribution from gravity is gonna be optimal and the bones are just gonna keep having optimal gravitational stress, which means you're gonna keep growing strong bones. If we change that and we lose that curve and now we have jamming happening, that jamming is gonna put different demand on the bones and the bones are gonna change their shape based on that change in demand. And so in this picture, you can see the edges of the bones. Here we've got a bone spur growing out. Now, what is gonna cause that? Well, attached to all the bones are muscles and ligaments. And if you start to stress on a, a muscle insertion or a tendon that's attached to the bone, when we stress that, that stresses the bone and bone is living tissue. So it will respond to stress and you're gonna lay down more and more bone cells in the areas that are being stressed. So if you tug on that bone ongoing, you're gonna start to grow a point there, which is what we call a bone spur. That's an osteophytic change, we call it. And so if you look at uh, muscle builders, right? Strength builders, weightlifters, their bones are actually wavy the shape of their bones, they're not straight, they're wavy because the muscles are tugging on the bones and they're gonna build bone up where it's tugging. And then the big bulky muscle is gonna be pushing against the bone and it's gonna wear away the bone there. And so if you looked at the skeleton of a weightlifter, they have wavy bones. If you look at the skeleton of someone who's paralyzed, their bones are very straight because there's no muscle tug on there that's gonna change the, the stress on the bones and change the shape of the bones. So the shape of the bones will change based on the stress that's being pulled on them. Now, when you have a forward curve and you have a spring in the spine, think of a bow and arrow. A bow and arrow would be an arch with the, the string holding it tight, right? And the bow and arrow is gonna work best when you have that everything in alignment with a forward arch in that bow. If you straighten that bow out or reverse it, that bow and arrow is not gonna work very well. And so when our neck has this nice curve to it, the muscles in the back of the neck that are pulling on the head and the back of the spine, right? They're gonna have a good forward curve and that's gonna be optimum function. If you start to bend the neck forward, you're gonna be pulling harder and harder on the base of the skull. And so we, what we are seeing is this crazy, crazy, formation of a spur at the base of the skull in people that have this whole tech neck thing happening. And there was a research study that was done. It was incredible. They, they actually did a, a survey of 1,200 subjects ranging in age from 18 to 86 years old. And they found that they were seeing these horn-like growths on the back of the skull that was linked to excessive phone and computer use. And this is what it looked like. You see right here on this picture, you see this, this is a bone spur on the back of the skull. It's a horn growing on the back of the skull. And do you see that the muscles in the back of the neck, they should be attached and there should be a forward curve with spring in the spine. But if you straighten that curve, now it stretches those muscles and they're tugging and tugging. And then you take that head and hold it forward and those muscles are tugging and tugging on the back of the skull. And they're literally seeing these horns growing on the back of the skull. Now, in this group of ages 18 to 86, they did not see this in the older people. The people that you would think would have arthritic changes, they never saw this showing up there. And in all of my schooling for 40 years, when I studied x-rays, they never talked about this horn on the back of the head. This is a new phenomenon that is showing up and it's showing up in our young people. And uh, I'll tell you what, it blew me away when I saw this. And when what they saw is that most of these horns were showing up in 18 to 30 year olds. Um, and 41% of the participants that showed up of 1200 subjects, 41% um, of the, the participants had the horn-like growths and they were in the 18 to 30 year old range. So it was the it was from tech neck posture that was causing it. <clears throat> so 41% of millennials were presenting with horn-like bony growths from their skulls. Incredible. 
So smartphones are literally transforming our bodies <laughs> as we speak. And it shows up exactly like this on the x-rays. Uh, and the other thing I want you to know is oftentimes we think of degenerative change in the spine, arthritic change as something that happens to old people. And what we actually are finding, I, I was astounded. It was the most disturbing news I had ever heard up to that point, as far as the spine goes, when a few years ago, I heard that in 2009, they did a study and they found that 9% of 10 year olds have degenerative change starting in their neck. 9% of 10 year olds. So this is a new phenomenon in this newest generation that we are seeing advanced degenerative change happening in the spine, but also these spurs forming on the back of the skull. Now the nerves that, um, and so here's some more of them here. There's another one and another one. They're all a little bit different looking, but it's uh, again, the same phenomenon pulling on the back of the skull. Uh, you can see how the head is going forward and there's a little spur showing up right there. So when you have neck pain, what are the solutions to it? What do we need to be correcting? The subluxations are usually going to be in the neck, but there will also be in the upper back. So we definitely want to check the alignment of the vertebrae in the neck. C1 to C7, you have seven cervical vertebrae. So we want to check the alignment of each one of those. Any one of those misaligned over time can also contribute to neck pain. But the upper back, again, is a very important factor for neck pain because we can have subluxations in these vertebrae here, and they're not doing their job to support the structure, which is then leading to problems up in the neck. And just like the muscle that pulls on the back of the head, it's also going to be pulling on the upper back if the head is being held forward. Uh, so we want to be adjusting both the neck and the upper back in many people if we do have the chronic neck pain. This is where the common subluxation patterns are that are the root of neck issues. And again, it's just the laws of physics. And it's it's the, due to our lifestyle habits, those micro traumas, the posture that is leading to and causing the subluxations and causing them to persist. <clears throat> so... Uh, you know, 45 degrees forward is 49 pounds of that, that, that head that should be weighing about what, 12 to 15 pounds, it's going to be weighing 49 pounds, 60 degrees forward, it's 60 pounds, 75 degrees forward, it's 70 pounds. Okay, here's a solution. There's no more stress on the head. <laughs> we just lose it. <laughs> so I had this one person come in and he was having extreme pain in his neck. It was going into his shoulder and his arm and his hand all on the right side. He also had sleep apnea. So what controls the soft palate, the integrity of the soft palate? It actually is nerves coming out of the neck. He also had chronic fatigue. He literally couldn't drive. He couldn't work. He couldn't play ball with his boy. And so he was in dire straits and he had to get care and he had to get it fast. And so when he got adjusted, he was able to work and he started exercising. He got his energy back and no more brain fog. Um, and so what was interesting is he found us on Facebook. Um, and so sometimes we will do, you know, education on Facebook and content on Facebook. And that's how some of you have found us. Um, and some of you also may share this with your friends through your emails and so on. So digital world, that is a way that we uh, reach out to people. He came in, we did the full exam the way we do with anybody and we gave him the recommendations. He followed the recommendations. Now, what was interesting was this was also during COVID time. So all of a sudden there was a lockdown thing scare and he decided he just needed to shelter in place. And so he stopped coming in for a while and it started coming back again. And then he came in and he got adjusted and again, he got control of it again and, and the pain went down again. So tech neck. It is a real problem. And um, if this is you or someone that you love, then uh, make sure you share this information with them. Um, again, you can see in this picture here, we see these spurs showing up right in the, the front in this case here. So uh, neck problems, again, they can lead to uh, neck pain, stiffness, tightness, lost range of motion. You know, you know who you are. Um, it's time to get serious about all these issues. If you keep popping and cracking your neck all the time, trying to release the tension, I, I really want you to know that, that all the parts of our body should be 
working at dropping tension in your system, not just popping it out of the, not just burping the Tupperware, right? Trying to get relief. We need to get the whole system learning how to drop tension more effectively. And these are correctable. We get excellent re results with all of these problems. So how do we get our results? It's a three-legged stool model that we use. First, we have to break the bad habits that we're doing that keep causing it to persist. They keep causing the supplications in the first place. And so we're, we teach people some key things on posture, how to have great posture, how to pay attention to the ergonomics. Uh, and so I do want to show you um, one thing that you can do. Let me just see. I think, I'm not sure I have a picture of it. Uh, I'm going to show you this in a little bit. So breaking the bad habits is one important part, but then adding specific exercises that can strengthen damaged tissues that are specific for the neck. Uh, remember, this is a done with you program, not a done for you program. So you do need to do your work too. So preparing the spine for sleep is a good way to reinforce the proper forward curve in the spine. Doing the stargazer exercise, doing the um, life extension exercises, Oh, and then we want to add those specific chiropractic adjustments so we can realign and establish the healthy normal motion and reconcile the adverse effects of the bad habits like the tech neck. So this other person that came in, they had this intense neck pain. It was radiating into their arm and their upper back, trouble sleeping. They couldn't work. They had two small kids, uh, started getting, oh, this is the one actually that I was just mentioning too. Um, they started getting good results, then they paused their care from COVID, they had a flare up, and then when they resumed, they got it under control, they were able to get back to work, take care of their kids, they actually were able to start working out with a personal trainer, they added yoga in, and so their life just went into an upward spiral. So breaking the bad habits is another important thing to deal with um, tech neck, and so one thing I want to suggest to you is, if you are using a handheld device, if you take a fist and you put it into your armpit, then <clears throat> when you hold your arm down, it's gonna hold it upright. So it's gonna be much easier to just hold your device out in front of your face instead of looking down. So it's hard to just hold it up without being supported. So if you take your fist, put it into your armpit, <clears throat> then it's a little easier to let your arm just be rested while you're holding your device in front of you. There's a, there's a device that I can demonstrate to you, right? So just like that. So just sticking the, the hand into the armpit can help that. Um, also getting a standing desk. Sean, I think I saw you moving around, transferring back and forth between standing and sitting. So getting a standing desk keeps you upright as well. And it'll minimize you leaning forward and sniffing the monitor that often happens when we're on our screens and when we're sitting. Um, when you're driving in your car, you want to make sure that your seat is up to 90 degrees, right? Not reclined back, because if the car seat is reclined back, you're going to have to bend your head forward to be able to see the road, and that's going to reverse the curve in your neck. So you want that seat up to 90 degrees. Now, car seats are actually made for subluxated people, and they're made to promote subluxations. How do I know that? Because when I sit in a car seat with it up to 90 degrees, many times, the headrest is pushed forward. And so you're now pushing your head forward. That's going to create that horn on the back of your skull too. So the fact that people have this bad posture, that's why they make the car seats that way. And what we want to do is we want to reconcile that. So on some car seats, if you put the seat all the way back, you can take the headrest off and turn it around because the back of it tends to be flat. And then when you bring it upright, it's not going to be pushing your head forward. Now, the importance of car seats with the headrest is the headrest must be within one to two inches, no more than two inches away from your head if it's going to protect you in a car accident. So make sure that if you do flip the head seat, the headrest, that you actually have it in a position that it is still going to be close to your head. Uh, if you can't flip the headrest, then another solution is putting a pillow behind your behind your back, and that will take up some space so that the headrest won't be pushing your head forward. Uh, another thing to be aware of is watching TV. And so sometimes when we're watching TV, we tend to slump down and now we've got a reversal of that curve. Um, if you're somebody that watches TV in bed, again, sometimes you're re reclining back and you, you may have reversed that curve. And then finally, sleep positions. 
<clears throat> so you want to make sure that you have the proper positioning when you're sleeping. And so there's a great pillow. It's called the proper pillow. And it literally has a dowel in it <clears throat> that can help to pr promote a healthy curve in the neck. In order for that dowel to work best, for the discs to do the remolding, when we're sedentary, those discs that we talked about with the imbibition, right? So when they get squeezed down, the water comes out. When they you release it, the water comes, uh, the nutrients come back in. So a disc can change its shape and its texture. When you're sedentary, the disc hardens up. So if you're in a bad posture late at night, looking at your device, the disc is gonna harden up in that po bad posture of a forward curve. So in order to get the disc malleable before you remold it, <clears throat> you want to turn your head back and forth about 20 times. And that movement back and forth is what gets the disc malleable. And once it's malleable, then you're going to lie on a dowel or a towel that's rolled up or on the proper pillow. And now the discs are malleable enough that the pillow is going to work better than if you just came off of a sedentary time on your phone and then just conk out on your on your bed. So do the take the 20 motions back and forth before you lay down on the proper pillow. And literally people tell me it is the best pillow they've ever had. And it's because it's designed to keep your spine healthy while you're sleeping. And so once you lie on your side, if you're a side sleeper, you'll notice that this pillow, it goes down right in the middle but the sides are built up. So when you're sleeping on your side, you don't want your neck to have too many pillows that are gonna tip your neck or not enough pillows or it's gonna tip it the other way. You want your neck to be straight when you're lying on your side. And so the proper pillow is built up. So on the when you turn on your side, you just go from the middle to the side. And now on this edge, you're gonna have that proper support of your spine being in line. So I love that proper pillow. Um, and people get great results with it. And people that are using it in my practice, it also helps us cover more ground during your visits because in between visits, you're doing the right thing to support your spine. Now, there are other things that we want to address when it comes to neck pain. And neck pain, again, we talked about there being inflammation. Now, sometimes it can be other aspects of your lifestyle, not just your posture, not just um, you having jarring of the spine, but other things can drive inflammation as well. And one of the things is having the wrong oils in your diet. So Americans really do consume too much omega-6 oils. And omega-6 oils come in the form of grains, also grain-fed meats, like conventional beef and, and so on. Um, also um, Salmon, uh, farm-raised salmon is fed grains instead of their natural food. So um, those um, conventional, conventionally grown and harvested um, animals are going to tend to have too much omega-6. And so it's the grains that also do that. So we have way too many grains in our diet, and that creates an imbalance between omega-6 and omega-3. And so what we want, we want to have a healthy balance between omega-3s and omega-6s. Now, omega-3s, the easiest form to get them is from fish oil. Fish oil has the exact uh, balance of omega-3s that can improve our brain function, that can decrease our inflammation, that can help all of our cell membranes and all of our hormones that we need to create. So we need those omega-3s. And so if we have way too much omega-6 in the diet, then we're going to get rigidity in our cell membranes and rigidity in our blood vessel walls and so on. So the omega-6, we need some omega-6. We need some because it provides structure to the cell membrane, but we need fluidity and adaptability in that cell membrane as well. And that's the job of the omega-3s. And so that's why we have a lot of trouble in our culture is that our cons Americans consume way too much omega-6. So how can you find, uh, and so the, the bad typical diet that has too much omega-6 is inflammatory and the good balance is anti-inflammatory, which means more pain and less pain, right? That's how it's linked. So if you're struggling with neck pain, it's an indication there's inflammation that's there. So we wanna address what's the cause of it, but we also wanna recognize that you may be having chronic low-grade inflammation in your body 
and it's showing up as pain in your neck. All right. So uh, I like to go through, how do you know the best fish oil? How can you tell when you, how to pick the best fish oil? <clears throat> so there's a few um, things that we can use here. We, there's a visual test that basically is just looking at the, the uh, looking at the expiration date, right? But looking at the oil itself and it should be clear, not cloudy. If uh, the fish oil is not a good one, it could be cloudy. So you it, you want it to be clear. Um, and then also the bite test. So you if you bite it, you can smell it. And you know we you know the fish has a smell to it. It has a flavor to it. But we all know what a rancid taste is. And so if you just swallow a capsule without tasting it. It, it may be that it's not a good brand and they're using rancid oil. So if you bite it and it doesn't taste rancid, then that's a good sign. Uh, so, you know, that, you know, I mean, you know what like rancid milk is, you know, you know, you know what that is. So you'll know when you bite into it that it's bad. Uh, then also just looking at the, the label and what kind of antioxidants is it being stabilized with? So uh, these are the healthy antioxidants, vitamin E, rosemary, lemon oil. And astaxanthin is another really good antioxidant. And then again, just check the expiration date and make sure the oil is not expired. Uh, what's the difference between liquid and fi fish oil and soft gel fish oils? Uh, well, if you need to do a high dose, so if you really are struggling with a lot of inflammation in your body, you may want to be taking more um, more of that fish oil. And so it's easier to use liquid if you have to take a high dose. Some people have trouble swallowing capsules, so the liquid is good for that. Um, it does oxidize faster, and some people don't like the taste, so the capsules are good for that purpose. And if you have children, infants and toddlers, uh, then for them, giving them a little bit of liquid is the way to go. Uh, so there are some other supplements that I recommend for addressing inflammation as well, and that comes in the form of turmeric and hemp oil. Uh, so turmeric forte is uh, it's the most it's the the most selling product that um, Standard Process and Mediherb has. And when they came out with it about I don't know maybe five years ago, it got such great results that it became their number one seller. And this particular version of turmeric is different than any other I've found because it's infused in tum in uh, the turmeric is infused in fenugreek, and that actually makes it twenty six times more absorbable. So you're gonna get a lot more function from it with a, taking a, a lot less than you would if you were taking other turmeric products. So I love the turmeric forte. Um, the recommendation is, is to do four per day if you are struggling with inflammation. And then usually after you've gotten that inflammation under control, you can drop it down to two per day. So uh, you know anybody that's like in my age group, middle-aged and older, I'm going to recommend just stay with at least two turmeric forte per day because the the inflammation that we uh, the the stresses we've already encountered and the inflammation that may have built up. Boswellia also has turmeric in it, but it has frankincense in it as well. And the other name for frankincense is boswellia. So this boswellia complex has both the turmeric and the frankincense. Um, so it actually does help with a lot of joint inflammation specifically. Uh, so it's another good product. Um, and for some people, I test them to see which one is going to work better for them. Uh, and some people like to use a little bit of both. And then the hemp oil complex. So many people are aware of CBD as something that is used for painkiller um, effects. And so uh, this hemp oil complex is, uh, a, again, one that helps a lot of that um, reducing and re resolving chronic inflammation. All right. And so I want to now show you uh, some of the exercises that you can be doing to help to address neck pain. And so this is one is called the, um, the life extension exercises. We use the acronym YWLT uh, because you're going to put your hands in the shape of a Y. That's the first step is the Y. Uh, and when you put your arms up, you want to actually point your fingers up into the sky strongly. So you're gonna do that Y pressing straight up, 
not straight up, but out at an angle. And you want to make sure that your arms are in line with your ears. So your arms are not out here. You want to try to get them back. And in the beginning, you may only be able to do this, but over time, you want to just keep bringing them back more and more so that they're in line with your ears and your head. So you hold that for about 20 seconds. I, I usually take a couple of breaths in this um, position. And then the second position is the W. And so the W is trying to put your elbows into your back pocket. So you just try to push your elbows into your back pocket. And you hold that for 20 seconds. And then the L is the elbow being bent to the side. And again, you wanna have your hands, try to have them in line with your body, not out in front. So not out in front of you, but back in line with your body. So, so that if you were looking straight out at the horizon, your peripheral vision couldn't see your hands, your fingers wiggling. So that again, you're gonna have to work at that if you don't have that flexibility yet. So you're gonna have to stretch that out. And then the T is holding the arm straight, both arms straight out to the side. And again, just pushing the fingers way, way out away from you. And so again, and, and again, back, not out in front, but back in line with your body. So if you do 20 seconds in each of those positions, um, and you do one round for every two hours of sitting, then that's going to help to reconcile if you're doing things that might tend to put you into that forward head posture. Um, there's another one that's called the stargazer. So the stargazer is where you simply are going to look back and back and back with an arc to your neck. So it's not a, it's not a crunch to your neck. It's an arc. You want to feel a stretch coming right through the front of your body if you're doing it properly. That's the stargazer. And so again, I like to do that, you know, for every couple hours of sitting, you're going to do a stargazer. You might even do it every 45 minutes if it feels good. Because uh, our ancestors, they would have been gazing at the trees and the stars and the clouds. And we tend to gaze down. So we've got to reconcile that. And then there's this uh, exercise called the wall nod. So the wall nod is where <clears throat> you're going to stand with your your back and your head against a wall. And the key is you're going to keep your head and your back, upper back against the wall. So when you look up, you're going to slide your head down like this. So the head's going to stay against the wall, but the back has to stay against the wall too. So you're not going to look up by chest, the chest coming forward. So the chest is going to stay against, the back is going to stay against the wall and you're going to nod up. And then when you look down, the head stays against the wall. So the head's not coming forward away from the wall. It's staying on the wall as you stretch down. And so if you do five nods up and down twice a day, that's a good way to just keep that motion and flexibility in the neck. Uh, so how would you know if you had a subluxation? Well, we would have to measure it. Just like you don't know if you have a cavity, you go to the dentist and they tell you you have a cavity. Yeah, you, I didn't even feel it. By the time you're feeling it, it's already hitting the nerve. You've got a lot of damage. So how would you know if you had a subluxation? We can't rely on how it feels. Remember, that's only 10% of the nervous system. We have to measure it. And so we use obje five objective criteria. The instrumentation that we use, the scanning of your nervous system, um, that's one way of measuring the nerve supply of the muscles and the nerve supply of the organs. Then when I feel your spine, I'm feeling for the motion in the spine. So if I find a, a joint that's fixated, that's where it's strapped down. And so that's a sign of where there may be a subluxation. Even just the static palpation without moving the spine, just feeling if a vertebra is off to one side, that's part of that criteria. Visualization is looking at posture. So this is something that you can do with your own friends and family or even with yourself looking in the mirror where you can actually do an assessment and looking straight ahead. Are my ears level or is my head tipped? Uh, are my shoulders level or is one higher than the other? And the same thing with the hips. And then from the side, is the head being carried forward or is the head, the center of the head right over the center of the shoulder? So those are some of the ways that we're going to visualize whether there's good or bad posture in the neck. And then, of course, the x-rays are useful not just to look at the alignment, but also to look at how long has the problem been there and is there any signs of degenerative change. So three steps to correct the cause, break the bad habits, add the specific exercises, and the chiropractic adjustments. That's the way we do it. Now, 
procrastination is the thief of health. So the five, you have to get checked to know whether you have subluxations, but then remember you want to be action oriented about taking steps. So if you, if you, all of you that are watching right now, I know you're under care. So I want you to make sure you don't procrastinate with doing the proper exercises, getting your ergonomics right, uh, getting the proper fish oil or anti-inflammatory nutrients in, looking at your diet, going with the anti-inflammatory diet. So those are all your action steps that you want to be taking. And if you are somebody watching this recording and you haven't had your spine checked yet, then please don't wait. Make sure you do get your spine checked by a chiropractor as soon as possible because it may be the solution you're looking for to end your neck pain. So that's what I've got for you all tonight. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And I'm going to just um, drop out of the, let's see if I can do this here. All right, I want to um, just stop the recording here.